Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Sports Medicine Concepts Sports Emergency Care White Paper Sessions. Today, we will be going over management of heat-related conditions as part of our white paper series, and actually the grand finale of this year's white paper series as we will take a break from the white paper sessions um, during the late spring and early summer as we all venture out to do our emergency response training for the summer. So uh, I welcome you to this session. My name is Mike Sendoma, and I am the moderator for today's session. I'm also the curriculum director for Sports Medicine Concepts, as well as an athletic trainer here locally at Livonia Central School District. Uh, we hope to today to bring to you an evidence-based approach to management of exertional heat and heat-related illnesses. And many of you know from our approach in the past and from uh, attending programs with us in the past that our approach is very much evidence-based and is a three-prong approach to that where we do take in careful consideration the peer-reviewed literature. We mix that with expert opinion as well as a pragmatic application that we have the luxury of being able to provide through the in two minutes or less sports emergency care programming that we teach throughout the course of the year. So it's that peer-reviewed literature as well as the expert opinion and the pragmatic application that we collect while we're out teaching that allows us to bring that information back and uh, provide this unique perspective on many of these sports emergency care topics that we, that we address in our white paper series. As a moderator, let me take a few minutes uh, of our time to go over some housekeeping items. Uh, in particular, the continuing education, because I know everyone is always concerned or interested to know about the continuing education. You will receive one hour of BOC Category A continuing education for your time here with us this afternoon. That certificate will come attached to a follow-up email, and that follow-up email will come within 24 hours of completion of the program. That is different than the program follow-up email, which you will get within an hour of the close of this session. That is delivered with one hour of program completion, and that will have a program evaluation as well as materials links for you for today. Uh, I would ask that you do take a minute uh, to complete that program evaluation. That information is vital to us as we continue to develop more programs and rework the curriculum based on the evaluation and the feedback that we get from participants. That's uh, a vital step for us as we continually review the program to make sure that it is on point and meets the objectives that we have of providing that pragmatic application. So I'll look forward to uh, reading your program evaluations. And I also respond directly to anything that you type into that. So if you do have questions or comments, um, I will respond directly to those. The materials link for you today, you'll find in your uh, participation window, which I'll go over here momentarily. Today we have links to our YouTube channel, which provides uh, recordings of all of our prior white paper sessions as well as a host of other video snippets if you will addressing specific sports emergency care topics that uh, you can view at any time uh, and, and at no charge. Again those are the session recordings found on YouTube. Uh, this session is also being recorded at this time and will be added to the sports emergency care white paper sessions that are on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel to be notified when new content becomes available. We hope you'll stay connected with us. Be the first to know when new sports emergency care content is available. Links to program registration uh, and sportsmedicineconcepts.com, our website, where we release information about the new schedule that will be coming up for the white paper series uh, at, at, that will resume in the fall, late summer, early fall. Uh, so you can stay connected with us to learn about that, as well as other on-point information. We also have what is referred to as the, the Friday uh, um, Information Friday series, uh, which is still ongoing. We, we produce those videos on a regular basis. Uh, we have a couple of really interesting ones, including uh, reviews of some of some new helmet technology that has come out. So we'll provide those reviews in our Information Friday segments, which, again, are found on our YouTube channel. You'll be notified when that content is uploaded uh, by staying with us on Twitter, Facebook, or by 
uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel. So we look forward to, uh, to having you do that. All right, so how do you participate in today's webinar? It's pretty easy. Daryl does most of the work for us today, so we can all sit back and just listen to the insight that uh, Daryl will have for us today. But there are some other things that we can uh, review just so you know, some things about that participation pane that's in the, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. That allow, you can open and close your participation panel by clicking on that red button, uh, the red arrow button, and you can close and open that participation pane, depending on your preference. You can also do that from the menu across the top of the participation pane as well. By default, you are set to use microphone and speakers today, uh, but you, if you do have problems with your audio, you can switch to, mic, uh, to telephone if you need to. You can click the audio setup button to reset your audio if you're having trouble, or click the radio button uh, to use the telephone. If you do do that, what you'll find is a drop-down menu will, will, will uh, show up and give you a dialing uh, phone number as well as an access code and audio pin. Questions for the most part for today's session will be handled at the end. We'll have a question and answer uh, session at the end. So after Daryl's presentation, I'll come back in as the moderator. Uh, and I'll be watching as the program progresses for those uh, questions to come in. So please to type those in at any time during, your, during the presentation. Uh, down in the lower right-hand side of your participation pane, you'll see that there's a chat window. Go ahead and open up that chat window and type in your question at any time. And again, as the moderator, I'll be watching those questions and we'll pose as many of those questions to Daryl as we can at the end of the session. Uh, those that we can't get to, we will certainly uh, find the correct answers to those questions and respond to you by email to make sure that you get uh, the, the appropriate answers you're looking for. If you do have something particularly relevant to the topic at hand uh, and, and the discussion that is presently going on, you can raise your hand by clicking on the raise your hand button in the participation pane. That will alert both Daryl and I that there is a question that is eating at you so bad you can't wait until the question and answer uh, portion of the program, which is fine. Uh, we like those types of questions equally. Uh, and at that time, we will uh, we'll answer that and address that question or comment uh, at the most appropriate time. So without further ado, I'm gonna switch controls over, give Daryl control of the, uh, of the program for us today. And before I do that, as, as he's uh, double checking and making sure his slide presentation is up and ready to go, I'll give you a brief introduction. Daryl Conway, uh, today's presenter, serves as the Senior Associate Athletic Director, Student Athlete Health and Welfare at the University of Michigan. Daryl came to the University of Michigan in 2013 from the University of Maryland, where he served as the Assistant Athletic Director for Sports Medicine. He also worked full-time as an athletic trainer at the University of Central Florida. University of Northern Iowa, Morgan State University, the University of Delaware, and the New York Jets Football Club. Daryl holds a master's degree from Adelphi University in sports medicine and sports management, and a bachelor's degree from the University of Delaware in physical education studies and athletic training. In addition to being a certified member of the National Athletic Trainers Association, Daryl has worked with various SWAT teams as their tactical medic and athletic trainer. As a volunteer EMT, and has been an American Red Cross first aid, CPR, and AED instructor for greater than 25 years. Daryl's professional interests lie in the fields of emergency planning, catastrophic and crisis re response, risk management, and cervical spine injury management. I'm glad to have with us uh, Daryl Conway today to lend his expertise. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Daryl Conway. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, talking today about exertional heat illnesses, uh, our objectives right right from the beginning. Um, you can see we'll talk about a pre-hospital uh, interprofessional healthcare team and how that works collaboratively to improve patient outcomes, discuss emergency action principles as they apply to heat-related illnesses, um, talk about the incidence of heat-related conditions, and then effective strategies for recognition and management, and then bring it all together for bridging the gap kind of bottom line feature to discuss the recommendations 
current evidence and current practices and how we can bridge that gap between the two. Daryl, if I can interrupt you just for a minute, it appears that uh, you are self-muted on your on your end. We can't hear you. There you go. Okay. Perfect. There you go. Uh, if it's predictable, it's manageable. Uh, another favorite quote of mine, if we can predict that something's going to happen, we should be able to manage that ahead of time. Uh, favorite quote by Dr. James Andrews is no such thing as always and never. Every emergency situation is different. Every patient is different. Our individual circumstances must dictate our appropriate actions. So getting into the incidents of, of exertional heat illnesses among U.S. high school athletes, these are sports other than football. You can see by state where the highest incidence of those issues are. Um, also looking at for football athletes, uh, state by state, you can see where the highest incidence of exertional heat illnesses among high school football athletes are across the United States. Looking at specifically exertional heat stroke, it's one of the top three causes of sudden death in sports, right behind cardiac issues and head injuries. 2005-2009 um, was our deadliest period in the previous 35 years with 18 deaths, and then we've eclipsed that 2010 to 2014. There have been 20 deaths uh, during that, that period of time. Looking specifically at football, uh, a lot of research has been done showing that football has 11 times higher risk of exertional heat illness. Um, from 1931 to 1998, there were 98 99 deaths, an average of 1.48 per year. Um, the last 15, 16 years, we've had almost three deaths from football, exertional heat stroke per year. Some of the reasons for that, uh, I think you look at the equipment, uh, you get decreased evaporative body surface area uh, with football equipment on, uh, increased evaporative resistance. Um, decreased permeability, um, so it's basically harder to evaporate sweat for all the football equipment on. The student athlete experiences a higher metabolism in pads, also with the equipment on. Anthropometrics, uh, looking at the data, 60% uh, of the known fatalities weighed greater than 242 pounds. 79% um, of those known fatalities were considered obese by standards. Um, we also know that Rectal temperature increases faster as lean body mass increases, and student athletes wear football pads. Time of the year, um, interesting statistic that 58 of the deaths happen between 8 o'clock a.m. and 12 o'clock uh, p.m. when that relative humidity is usually high in the morning time. Going back to it's harder to evaporate sweat when the relative humidity is high. 86% uh, of deaths took place in the first two practices. The majority of deaths took place in August. Um, and showing that increased incidence during the first 14 days of football practice. Also looking at the environmental conditions, um, there's an increased rate when the L, uh, wet bulb globe temperature is greater than 82 degrees. You can see where all the deaths are marked across the country um, and what the wet bulb was at those, at those different times. So, so this overall, um, we know that our rectal temperature is higher when full uniforms are worn during exercise. We know that our rectal temperature increases um, faster when football uniforms are worn. And we know that uncomp uncompensable he heat stress occurs at lower relative humidity and temperatures when wearing football pads. All these are, are reasons why we're seeing more exertional heat stroke with regards to football. So some of the prevention strategies. 
Um, obviously doing a thorough PPE, that's kind of a prevention strategy for a lot of things. Um, but during that PPE, are we asking about recent activity level? Are we asking about a, a previous history of heat stress? Thinking about who gets that information from PPEs. Are you sharing it with coaches? Are you sharing it with strength coaches? So everybody on that performance team, every single person out at practice would know if somebody has a history of, of heat stress. Um, what labs are you doing? Are you doing sickle cell testing? Does everybody have that information? Thinking about acclimatization over the 7 to 14 day period that's recommended. Um, is that only for football or do you acclimatize all sports? Do all sports have that acclimatization uh, program going, going in place in August? Um, if you do a conditioning test with your team, uh, who decides what that conditioning test is? Is it used as a punishment? Is it used as a punishment for if you didn't make every single workout during the summer, then you have to take the conditioning test at the end of the summer or the beginning of preseason? Do you train your freshmen and transfers differently than your upperclassmen that's been in the program for two or three years? What do you do if those student athletes have joined the team, say, the first day of school when the rest of the team has been training for two or three weeks? Um, how, do you, how do you acclimatize them? How do you transition them into the regimen going on with that team. Education, probably one of the most important things. Who gets educated? You just educating the student athletes, the coaches, the athletic trainers, strength coaches, parents, administrators. Um, what topics are you educating them on? And probably most importantly, are you documenting that education? So are you documenting, do you have sign-in sheets that these these individuals have been educated? Uh, you see here uh, article from 2014 about most strength and conditioning coaches lack the essential knowledge to prevent or recognize exertional heat stroke. Hydration. What are you doing from a hydration plan? What are you doing from a nutrition plan? Uh, how are you measuring? Are you doing uh, pre and post weights? Um, who's monitoring those weight systems? So is it the student athlete on the honor system? Um, or do you have a coach or an AT student or staff member there charting down the weights as it, as they move forward. Um, is there a plan for removing those student athletes that have lost two to three to four percent of their body weight? And what is that plan? Um, what is your nutritional plan for practices? Not just a hydration plan, but also a nutrition plan. Do you take those mid-practice breaks for both nutrition and hydration? Um, are you looking at medications? What medications the student athletes on? And how does how are those medications affected by heat? Some other prevention things. Um, McKenzie in 2015 uh, said that urine color assessment can be a valid, practical, inexpensive tool. Do you have these urine color charts up? Where are they located? Um, do you put them behind the stalls? Do you, do you hand them out to people so that uh, urine color, uh, they can use that in assessing their hydration size? This is something that I've used over my career. And it's probably the one thing that the student athletes can tell you uh, all throughout the year of what color their urine is um, as, a, as a measure of their hydration. Some other prevention strategies, communication. How are you communicating to coaches? How are you communicating to administrators, both in the preseason, during the heat emergency, and after? Um, what's your staffing? What are your facilities? What equipment do you have available on site? Um, What's your EAP? Do you have a heat emergency plan? What's your plan for recognizing heat emergencies, dealing with them? What training do you do? Uh, we all practice cervical spine injury training at the beginning of August, but how many times do we practice taking the unconscious athlete and carrying them 20 yards and putting them in a cold tub and getting them out of the cold tub if we have to do other measures? Um, and do we take that time out that's recommended by the NATA? Do we take that time out not just at games, but every day at practice? Do we take 30 seconds to recognize what our staffing is, who it is, and what we're going to do in terms of an emergency? Big thing with me is in times of stress, you always fall to the level of your training, not rise to the level of your expectations. So do we do that stressful training and practice in that, in that manner? With regards to a heat policy, um, obviously all schools should have a, a plan for modification of activities. Um, that plan should be region or school specific. Um, who signs off on that plan? Who reviews that plan? And what is your communication? How are you going to communicate to the coach? How are you going to communicate to the administrator that 
this is coming down the line or we must modify a practice today. Uh, it's recommended that the heat policy be based off of wet bulb globe temperature, not heat index, but that's not always possible for every single person. Some of the things your heat policy should include. Uh, modifications for equipment, modifications for work rest ratios, uh, modification of practice time. Um, when are you taking water breaks? How are you modifying practice to add more water breaks? What are your pre and post activity weigh-in guidelines? Or does your school have guidelines of these student athletes must weigh in pre and post? Um, what's your recognition and management guidelines, which we'll talk about? And then your return to play. I think that's something that a lot of people uh, forget about is what is our return to play after a heat illness? Some other components to, to consider, how often do you monitor uh, heat index at WBGT? Um, where do you measure it? Um, do you have a backup source? If your main source goes out, what is your backup source that you're going to utilize? Again, how do you communicate with the administration? How do you communicate with the coaches? When do you communicate that? Um, rest breaks that are planned to match the intensity. Uh, again, what is a definition of a, of a practice versus a walkthrough? Um, so if you say practice must be modified, does a coach then say, okay, well, we aren't going to go in pads, but we're going to do a three-hour walkthrough out on the concrete or out on the field. Those athletes are still out in the heat. So making sure that you have a good definition of a practice versus a walkthrough and what's allowed um, at different times. Um, and then, again, your hydration and nutrition considerations. Looking at wet bulb globe temperature, uh, that's the equation to measure it. There's several commercial devices out there um, that will put that equation all in at one time and give you a number. Um, if wet bulb globe is not available, what are some other things that you can do? There are some good charts available. Uh, this is one of the charts that I found that gives you a good estimation of what the wet bulb globe temperature is that you can get from any uh, reliable weather information that you have on your phone or in your community. Um, heat index chart, this is a, you know, a long-standing chart with heat index if you can't uh, utilize the wet bulb globe temperature. The current ACSM guidelines uh, with regards to modification of activity uh, are based on the wet bulb globe temperature, uh, both Fahrenheit and Celsius, uh, goes through uh, both non-acclimatized, unfit, high-risk individuals and your acclimatized, low-risk individuals and, and basically when and, and how you should modify those activities. And we'll talk about this a little bit later in the presentation about some other considerations for some regionalized guidelines. This is a Georgia Athletic High School Association guidelines of most of the guidelines that I looked at. Uh, most people reference Georgia because they were the first ones to have uh, specific in their guidelines for football athletes with regards to equipment. So these, these guidelines are referenced a lot uh, in terms of um, various high school guidelines. So when we talk about recognition of heat illnesses, um, two main diagnostic criteria, profound CNS dysfunction and elevated core body temperature. Uh, great video from the 1984 Olympics. It was actually on Sports Center this morning um, of, of Gabrielle Scheiss, one of the Olympians that um, I don't know how many of you remember when she came in for the final lap around the track. She was staggering and, and loss of balance and dizzy throughout the entire uh, realm. They, they uh, allowed her to continue around that track. She collapsed right at the right at the end. There's a great video on YouTube of her talking about that, about how she had been suffering through the whole race uh, with regards to uh, heat illness and it had symptoms throughout the entire race. So one of the controversial topics uh, surrounding exertional heat stroke is around rectal uh, temperatures. Uh, it's been widely publicized that assessment of rectal temperature is a gold standard for attaining core body temperature. Uh, it's been well publicized that the other methods, whether it be oral or temporal or, or invalid methods of obtaining um, a core temperature, and you shouldn't waste your time substituting those invalid, those invalid measures. 
Okay, so some of the reasons that you should do rectal temperature, um, A, it confirms an exertional heat stroke diagnosis. Um, there are many signs and symptoms of exertional heat stroke that can mimic other conditions, but the one commonality among exertional heat stroke victim is that their core temp is elevated. So doing a rectal temperature right away confirms that diagnosis. It also gives you a guideline for when to remove that athlete from cold water immersion to prevent hypothermia. Uh, we'll talk about some of the research uh, later about that, but you, you really want to be removing that athlete at 102 degrees Fahrenheit. It also assists you in developing return to play criteria. A lot of the testing coming out of Corey Stringer Institute with regards to return to play, uh, they, they look into what their rectal temperature was at the time of injury um, and, and helping them decide what their return to play criteria is going to be. So you may say, I'll just put them in the tub and not do rectal temperature. So this is a case study from Gavin Class at Towson University, 2013. Uh, suffered exertional heat stroke at practice. He was in the cold water immersion, cold tub within five minutes of his symptoms. That's great timing there. Uh, they called EMS. Uh, they did not take a rectal temperature at the time that they put him in the cold tub. EMS responds within five minutes. Again, very good. As soon as EMS got there, they removed the student athlete from their cold water immersion. Um, transported him to the hospital, gets to the hospital. 30 minutes later, they finally get around to taking his rectal temperature. 30 minutes later, his rectal temperature is still 108 degrees. Not really good. Research is telling us we want to keep him in until that 102 degree mark. Uh, his outcome, he survived but had a, a ton of surgeries, had an emergency liver transplant. Came back in 2015, filed a lawsuit against the school to allow him to rejoin the team. So some research for, regarding the actual practice of, of taking rectal temperature. You can see uh, about 18% of the certified athletic trainers that responded said that they actually do rectal temperature. You can see the numbers almost at 50% for oral temperatures. Um, the majority of those responding um, that they do do rectal temperature at the college level versus the high school level and then you can see the experience um, of those responding. Some of their barriers that they said, uh, you know, privacy issues on the sideline, comfort of student athlete, too invasive. Um, I've not been trained. Uh, that's, you see that a lot for uh, people who rectal temperatures weren't in their training in college, that they're saying they have not been trained, they have little practice, um, insufficient instruction, um, don't have the equipment. They don't own a rectal temperature, uh, a rectal thermometer at, the, at their place where they work. Um, some of the other barriers, no protocol, not practical, um, not necessary to evaluate core body temperature, uh, Oral temperature along with symptoms are accurate enough, uh, not in my scope of practice. So when we talk about this, when we think about this, when we talk about privacy, so privacy should never trump patient care. Uh, if done right, you have a tarp, you have a sheet, that exposure to actually get the rectal thermometer in is less than 30 seconds. Um, and think about it. We would never say we aren't going to use an AED on a female patient because it's going to expose the chest. So should we be really worried about privacy for something that could save somebody's life? Uh, NATA uh, came up with the heat stroke treatment authorization form, uh, something that uh, a sample document that could be used at the high school level when you're dealing with minors to be able to have their, uh, their parent sign uh, stating that if, the, if in case you do need to do a rectal temperature that the parent is giving you permission to take those life-saving uh, life saving interventions with your student athlete. Again, something that you can consider if you're working at that high school level. In terms of rectal temperature, there was a study done with regards to how deep should you uh, place the rectal probe. Uh, this was done by Miller, uh, published in 2016 in the Journal of Athletic Training. Uh, basically, his research uh, showed that the depth of the rectal probe does matter um, and that inserting the rectal probe about 6 inches or 15 centimeters provides the most accurate measure of core body temperature. So as we're doing this, we need to think about making sure we have that rectal probe at, at the appropriate depth. 
So the steps for rectal temperature, um, get consent uh, first and foremost. Uh, minimize their exposure to sheets, towels, or tarps. Cover, make sure you use your lubricating jelly. Place a student athlete prone or sidelining. Make sure you bend their knees up. Uh, spread the buttocks. Gently insert the probe about 15 centimeters or about 6 inches. Use tape to secure it in place so when you place the person in the cold tub, the rectal temperature or rectal probe stays in place. Um, and then initiate cold water immersion right away. Research shows us that the two most important factors influencing the prognosis of exertional heat stroke is A, the degree of hyperthermia, and then B, the length of the time that the student athlete is hyperthermic. So the length of the time that they're greater than 105 degrees. Um, the goal of this is a golden half an hour. Um, get that core body temperature to less than 102 degrees in under 30 minutes. You can see the chart on the, on the right showing the survival rates of exertional heat stroke. When you get that core body temperature under 102 degrees within 15 minutes, you have over an 80% survival rate. In a half an hour, you have about a 50% survival rate. Understanding rapid diagnosis and rapid cooling are going to equal survival uh, in an exertional heat stroke. Cold water immersion has been shown to be the most effective um, and should be readily available. Okay, so you should have the ability to do a cold water immersion tank in an emergency situation right away, no matter where you are from a practice or play standpoint. So to your ideal cooling rates, there's been some research done with various different uh, ways to cool a person all the way from ice packs all the way up to ice water immersion. Um, the research shows us that acceptable cooling rate is 0 0.08 centimeter, or excuse me, 0 0.08 degrees Celsius um, per minute to um, 0.15 degrees Celsius per minute. Um, but your ideal cooling rate is greater than uh, 0.16 degrees Celsius per minute. Um, with that, if you needed to estimate, you're going to get about a, a one degree Celsius core body temperature decrease for every five minutes that they're in cold water immersion or about a one degree Fahrenheit core body temperature decrease for every three minutes that they're in, in cold water immersion. Again, looking at the current knowledge, attitudes, and practices of different certified athletic trainers, uh, this done in 2010, about 50% of certified athletic trainers were using cold water immersion. Um, colleges were uh, greater than 62%, high schools were about 37, 35%. Um, then you can see the experience is about the same um, for less than 10 years or greater than 10 years. Some of the barriers that people stated as to why they aren't using cold water immersion uh, don't have the necessary equipment, um, staffing issues, no facilities, uh, practice field is not equipped, um, you know, too much of a shock to the system. Uh, it's easier and more efficient for us to use spray, cold, and a large fan. Um, easier to get ice towel and ice bags or cold shower. Um, so those are some of the barriers that people listed um, as to why they aren't using that, that cold water immersion. So a protocol for cold water immersion A, that preparation and planning. Taking the time out uh, beforehand to make sure you know what the plan is. Making sure your, your cold water immersion modality is prepared. Um, ideally, you should have the water temp around 35 degrees Fahrenheit to 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, once they're in there, you need to be vigorously circulating the water. Again, preparation and planning how you're going to do that. You're going to have a crutch. You're going to have a stirring stick. You're going to do it with your hand. Um, making sure that we have total body coverage as much as possible. Um, you know, do you have towels and sheets available to for that total body coverage so they don't slip down and drown if they go unconscious. What other auxiliary modalities or devices are you going to use? You're going to have cold towels available. You're going to have ice bags available that you can cover their head. Or if they, if you don't have the ability to do total body coverage, what else can you do for the parts of the body that are out of the water? Make sure you're activating your EAP. 
Make sure you're assessing core body temperature and vital signs pre-immersion. Again, we need to know what their temperature is and then when they reach that 102 degrees to prevent that aftershock. Making sure you're reassessing vital signs while they're in the, the cold water immersion. Uh, if possible, if they're conscious, getting them some oral fluids. Um, if they're conscious or unconscious and you have the training and expertise, getting an IV in them to get some fluids to them. Using your accessory cold towels, cold water dousing, ice bags to help that per part of the body is not in that total body uh, coverage. And then discontinuing your, your cold water immersion when the temperature reaches, when their core body temperature reaches 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, making sure you're working with your EMS from a cold first transport second uh, protocol. So you're talking with EMS that if we have a exertional heat stroke, they should be in the cold water immersion by the time EMS arrives, but also that EMS isn't going to pluck them out of there right away, that we're going to work to get that core body temperature down to 102 degrees uh, before we're, we're taking them out. Again, remembering uh, if you don't have access to that uh, rectal temperature uh, or if you're just estimating, you can estimate that about one degree uh, Celsius for every five minutes or one degree Fahrenheit for every three minutes if the water is aggressively stirred. And then ultimately transferring your patient to EMS. So some research about what, what is the ideal water temperature. Um, again, that 35 to the 59 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the water temperature should be stirred to maximize cooling. There's been some research with regards to temperate water temperature. Um, what happens if you don't have cold water, you don't have access to that much ice? Can you just use room temperature or hose temperature water? Um, temperate water temperature does produce acceptable, acceptable ideal cooling rates um, with, and without foot, with and without football equipment. Temperate water does take about two times as long um, to cool the person as compared to your cold water immersion. Thinking about lean uh, body surface to lean body mass ratio of, and its effect on cooling rates. Um, individuals with a high uh, lean body mass or body surface to lean body mass ratio um, actually cooled greater, uh, 1.7 times greater than those that had low uh, lean body mass, both during cold water immersion and temperate water immersion. Um, this study done in 2014 also showed the cold water immersion uh, cooled about 2.7 times faster um, compared to temperate water immersion. Thinking about football equipment, um, NATA position statement uh, recommends removing excess clothing equipment uh, prior to getting in the tub. Uh, there is some research done by Miller out of uh, Central Michigan looking at um, do you have to remove the, the football equipment before you put them in the tub? His research showed that the uh, average cooling rate for pads in cold water was acceptable. Remember that acceptable or ideal range is greater than uh, 0.15 degrees Celsius per minute. Um, the average cooling rate for people in football pads was 0.22 degrees Celsius per minute. So pads do not interfere with water access to the body. Um, you can cool with the football pads on if necessary. Um, Pads should be removed, however, um, if you know the individuals knowledgeable and any that equipment removal are present. You have the tools available. Um, the pads can be uh, easily removed, or the pads interfere with the ability to fully immerse. So, if you don't have scissors right there on you, or um, somebody doesn't know how to remove the pads, you can just dunk them right in the water. Uh, remove the pads while they're in the water, or remove the pads after they get out. Um, you're going to get those ideal cooling rates no matter whether or not pads are on or pads are not on. Some alternative methods. Uh, this is a good article uh, that just came out on, on the TACO method, the TARP assisted cooling with oscillation. Um, you can see it's basically this, a, a $5 TARP from Home Depot. A bunch of people hold it up, kind of form a little uh, cocoon or TACO, put the person in it, and uh, dump ice water on top of the person. This is great for uh, those sites. You may be out at a soccer tournament where you have multiple fields and you aren't able to have the big uh, cold tanks at all the different fields. Um, those schools on a budget, you can certainly afford 
a seven dollar tarp and utilize the water and ice from your water boys or your coolers that are on the field as an immediate uh, way to get them into an ice tub right away. There are some commercial devices out there. The Polar Life Pod is one of those commercial devices um, that you can buy um, that basically does the same thing as, as a tart method uh, does in performing and allowing that taco method. Some alternative methods, you know, what reaches that acceptable range um, in addition to uh, cold water immersion or temperate water immersion, uh, packing the body in ice bags, packing the body in ice towels, um, IV fluids with ice packs um, at the major arteries, helicopter downdraft, um, IV fluids and ice towels, all those methods uh, meet that minimum acceptable uh, cooling, cooling rate. Some of the unacceptable ones or unacceptable alternative methods, just doing IV fluids with nothing else doesn't meet that cooling uh, rate that you need. Dousing just with water, just general ice packs, not really ice bags with those crushable ice packs that you see on EMS sometimes. Um, just fanning the person won't reach that acceptable cooling rate. Um, cooling vests and cooling blankets have shown um, that, they, that they don't meet that cooling rate. So if you have uh, supplemental treatments you want to do, um, IV fluids, definitely feasible when you're in a cold water immersion situation. Oxygen administration is definitely feasible. If you need to use the AED, though, you do need to remove that athlete from the cold water immersion. Um, preventing hyperthermic afterdrop, again, if you have the flexible rectal uh, thermometer in place, you're going to remove that athlete at 102 degrees. That will help prevent that afterdrop. Um, if you don't have a flexible rectal thermometer, but you're using an inflexible one, take temperature and then use your typical cooling rate uh, to calculate when the rectal temperature will reach 102 degrees. Um, if you don't have a rectal temperature or a rectal thermometer, this institute cold water immersion for approximately 15 to 20 minutes using your best clinical judgment um, is when to cease that cooling therapy. Return to play, kind of the same as, as with concussions. No two student athletes are the same. No two exertional heat stroke cases are the same. Um, same day return is not uh, recommended. Um, looking through the literature, there's been few evidence-based strategies that have been developed. Um, most of the strategies for return to play just use the clinical cues, whether it be ongoing signs and symptoms, response from uh, heat tolerance testing, um, gradually increasing their exercise demands and their ability to acclimatize the heat. Um, either way, uh, the return to play should be individualized. It should be stepwise. Um, you should pretty much count on a 7 to 21 day initial rest period following the exertional heat stroke, um, trying to identify the cause, um, find a normal, trying to normalize the anatomic and physiological deficits associated with that heat stroke, Making sure they're asymptomatic, making sure you do labs before you start that gradual return to play process, and then starting your stepwise progression from low intensity to high intensity, um, graded progression to heat acclimatization, increased duration in that environment, gradually add equipment. You're constantly monitoring uh, rectal temperature, heart rate, hydration status, etc. I think something that a lot of people uh, forget about and return to play protocols is their psychological readiness. Um, do you have to involve other professionals with regards to their psychological readiness um, to return to play? 2007 American College of Sports Medicine published this um, guideline with regards to return to play after exertional heat stroke protocol. Again, not really uh, given any kind of definitive guidelines, but a good uh, template to start when you're working with your physician and others in, with regards to the return to play following exertional heat stroke. Documentation, let's not forget about that. Making sure your policies and procedures have been reviewed and, and approved by your team physician, your administration, your legal counsel, risk management. Making sure your EAP, and your crisis management planning, uh, has been documented and approved, making sure you integrate EMS into that, making sure EMS knows 
uh, what to expect, who to be there, what equipment you have on site, making sure EMS is on point with the cool first, transport second. Um, looking at your training and education. Um, what are you doing? Do you have a heat meeting? Is this something where you gather people together in the beginning of the summer um, to go over heat illnesses and what to do? So some bridging the gap uh, considerations. What person, considering what personnel are involved in the management of the emergency situation at all times, uh, whether or not it be a practice situation, a conditioning situation, a game situation, who's going to be there for the immediate care before EMS hap arrives, after EMS arrives, what happens if a visiting team, is it a strength and conditioning session, a practice, a game, and really asking yourself, are your coaches and strength coaches and other staff that are available, are they prepared to participate? Because you're going to need them to, to participate at some level. Thinking about pit crew concepts, that interprofessional practice approach, systems-based approach to managing emergency. Who's going to be there um, and, and how are other people going to integrate in when the EMS arrives, when the team physician arrives, when other help arrives? How are they integrating in? Are we prepared for that? Have we pre-assigned roles? Um, have we practiced it? Um, looking at a teamwork and looking at communication as the hallmarks for those pit crew concepts. Do you have a cold water immersion emergency kit prepared? Do you have a kit right there that, that has the things necessary, a cooling tarp, uh, tub, ice water, sheets, uh, towels, scissors, rectal thermometer, uh, tape, blood pressure cuff, uh, IV kits if you're certified to do IVs or you have somebody that's going to be at practice, is there IV kit right there readily available uh, to be able to put that IV in while they're in the tub? Um, do you have cold fluids available for them? Uh, most importantly, you know, what I learned, make sure you have the straws. We had to go to a local grocery store and buy the little flexible straws. So if they are conscious and able to keep down fluids, they're able to drink uh, water or Gatorade while they're sitting in a tub through one of those flexible straws. Do you have gloves? Do you have a sharps container? Is there a fan available? Um, do you have oxygen and AED? But really personalizing your cold water emergency kit to make sure that you have everything there to manage those heat illnesses. A climatization plan. Um, you can see two, two separate plans there. Um, the one on the right is the NCAA five-day acclimatization plan. The one on the left is the one recommended in the literature for uh, high schools um, and club sports activities, uh, more of a 14-day uh, acclimatization. You can see the differences between them. But basically, uh, going through a helmets only period, then a helmets and shoulder pads period, then a full equipment period. Uh, when you're allowing two a days, what's the total maximum duration of, of a single practice session? Um, you know, can you permit walkthroughs? What's the maximum time and what contact are you uh, permitting during, during those times? So really sitting down with your coaching staff and your administration and your school district to develop an acclimatization plan. Uh, not just for football, but for all sports. Again, going back to the Georgia uh, high school guidelines and the ACSM guidelines, thinking about those one size fit all. Um, if so, the southern states may never play football because they're generally over a lot of these guidelines for a good portion of the year. So do we need to come up with regional guidelines uh, with regards to wet bulb globe temperature? Um, Grunstein and all uh, in 2015 came up with some regional guidelines uh, using the 90 per 90th percentile warm season maximum. They defined that warm season as May to September, um, looking at the wet bulb globe temperatures during that time, um, and came up with basically what they call heat safety regions. Um, and then establish guidelines based on what your region is. So you can see the category three region. Um, it's basically anything uh, what they consider the hot region. Um, category 2 is a wet bulb globe temperature, uh, 90th percentile between 30 and 32. They consider that the moderate region. And then category 1 is less than 30 wet bulb globe temperature, and that's considered your mild region. Um, California went a step further. Um, they divide up their... Uh, their state in 10 different regions for high schools. So they kind of developed that 
uh, with regards to how those how those regions overlay in their state. And then we looked at revising uh, ACSM web uh, WBGT standards using the regional system. Um, so you can see there from a category one to a category two to a category three uh, where where they've revised and what the activity guidelines are. Um, you know, canceling activities in category one region at, at 29 degrees versus 32 degrees in a, in a category three, just based on the, the climate climatization of those regions. You can see they've gone through and revised the Georgia standard um, from a category one, uh, if, the, if that's what your high school was using, uh, category two, and then category three, uh, revising those standards uh, based on that, that research by Grunstein. So, the, so our bottom line, um, A, we must have good communication. Um, we must be prepared and must plan for these emergencies. We must educate. Uh, we make sure we educate everybody involved. That includes parents, that includes student athletes, that includes administration. Making sure we're doing a thorough PPE, we have an acclimatization plan, and we have a plan for hydration and nutrition. Um, understanding that football has 11 times higher risk. Uh, also looking at 58% of deaths happen in the morning at morning practices. Understanding our two main diagnostic criteria, elevated core body temperature and profound CNS dysfunction. Um, but also understanding privacy should never trump patient care when it comes to a rectal, te rectal uh, thermometer or rectal temperature measuring. Uh, rectal temperature is a gold standard. Um, don't waste time substituting an invalid method. Uh, making sure we have that proper depth for a rectal temperature of six inches or 15 centimeters. Um, if we do not have a rectal temperature uh, readily available, um, put them in a cold tub for 15 to 20 minutes. Our two most important factors um, with regards to the prognosis, um, the degree of hyperthermia and then the length of time that that student athlete is over that 105 degree temperature, that golden half an hour, aiming to get that temperature under 102 within a half an hour. Um, we know that cold water immersion is the most effective modality. Um, we want to use modalities that have the ideal cooling rates of greater than 0.16 degrees Celsius. Um, understanding that uh, individuals that have uh, increased lean body mass are going to have greater cooling rates than in individuals with uh, lower lean body masses. We want that water temp 35 to 60 degrees. We want to discontinue our cold water immersion when we're 102 degrees. Um, and sports equipment does not have to be removed prior to that cold water immersion. Then our three principal tenets to assure a favorable outcome, rapid assessment, immediate cooling, and then use of cold water immersion for cooling to give you those ideal temperatures. Uh, we understand morbidity and mortality increase the longer the student athlete's body is above that uh, critical threshold of 105. Um, again, cold water immersion is the best thing. And then for return to play, we want to individualize stepwise progression um, for that return to play. Bottom line, expect the unexpected. Understand that if it's predictable, it's manageable. Um, making sure that we take a team approach to how we manage this, making sure that we're involving everybody, that we're prepared, that our coaches, our strength coaches, our administrators who may be at a practice are prepared to act if anything should happen. Um, making sure we carefully weigh all of our factors, make our educated decisions on what best fits into your individual situations. Um, and then regardless of the situation, making sure we have that relentless preparation and planning um, and understanding the benefits and drawbacks of each uh, option. Then asking yourself, are you prepared for that ultimate emergency? Um, have we thought about it and are we prepared for that? I'll now open it up for questions or, or discussion that anybody has. Daryl, thank you very much. That was uh, an out outstanding uh, presentation, I, I have to say. Um, usually I, I find myself uh, watching 
uh, comments and stuff like that come in and paying attention to the software and making sure that that's staying up and running. But I, w I was, I found myself riveted to your discussion. So I, I mean, what, that was a fantastic presentation. And I have, I have a couple of things before we get to some of the comments. Um, I, I'm assuming you can hear me okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, your discussion about the the rectal temperature and using the uh, rectal thermometer reminds me a lot of 15 years ago our discussion about automatic uh, AED use. Uh, a lot of those same things come up in terms of uh, is it within our scope of practice and, and all those types of things but your suggestion that it is the gold standard which I know is reflected in the literature as, as well if it is the gold standard then how can we do any of those other things that you talked about Without being liable for less than, than providing less than best practice. Well, I mean, I think it's I think it's a gold standard, but I also think you know there's no such thing as always and never. Um, you know, there's going to be times where you know it's just m more practical to get them in the cold tub right away because a rectal thermometer may not be right next to you as, as you're going through. Um, especially if you're utilizing a tarp or you're out in the middle of a football field, you know, you aren't going to put the rectal thermometer in your, in your fanny pack. You're going to have it with the rest of your emergency equipment. Um, you know, I kind of look at it as uh, get the rectal thermometer in when you can, but the, get them into a cold tub if that's the first thing that you have available for you. I think you, at the end of the day, I think if you haven't done it and you're using the excuse of, Either I don't have the equipment or I've never been trained. Um, I think you are going to be liable at, at that point. But I, I also think if you have a legitimate reason as to why you haven't used it at that point, um, I think you, you should be fine there. But you need to make every effort to uh, get a rectal temperature uh, right yeah, away. So, so your argument there is, is, is not that is not really that there is not a legitimate reason to not have one available to you. You may ultimately make the decision that you don't have to use it at a particular time, but to make the argument that you don't have it because it's too expensive, because you didn't have the proper training or some of those other uh, excuses that people affront for not having one, those those just aren't, to me, those, those aren't acceptable. Correct. Correct. You know, I, I've had situations where the athlete was conscious, um, and the athlete was fighting me on it. Well, I'm not going to sit there and fight with an athlete for five right. minutes. I'm just going to go ahead and put them in the, in the uh, cold tub, you know, and use other measures as to when his uh, temperature is going to go down. But I think that's something if there was ever a case uh, brought about that, you know, I, I can very clearly articulate that, you know, the athlete was fighting me on it, and I felt at that time as best to get them cooled down as fast as possible versus fighting the athlete. You know, if the athlete's unconscious, I don't think you can utilize that excuse. Right. So so a, a question that might come up then is, is, is exactly that. If you have an athlete that's saying, hey, no way, or, or are you using that thing on me? Well, you, you know that they belong in the cold water immersion or there's a likelihood that they belong in there. You put them in the cold water, water immersion, and then you can use some of our charts that say, hey, this, this person is going to cool down at this rate. So we know that in 15 minutes, he's probably the likelihood is his temperature will be uh, in a range where we can safely remove him and transport him. So, it, you know, who's going to argue with you that? I mean, you're you're not going to, you know, force a kid down and put the rectal thermometer in. That that wouldn't be acceptable practice either. Correct. Um, but but I think the important point to make here is, if you have an unconscious athlete that is suffering from exertional heat illness and you don't have the rectal thermometer to use, I, the argument seems fairly strong that we're bordering on liable for that in, in the case of a, a negative outcome. Correct. Correct. I heard so, a friend of mine said one time, uh, if you use a rectal, in the heat stroke case, if you use a rectal uh, thermometer, you immediately get five expert witnesses on your side, five yeah. big time expert witnesses on your side. Um, so, so that that brings up the question then about scope of practice. It, in in your opinion, looking through the literature and stuff, is this is there any argument that this is beyond the scope of practice for an athletic trainer? And let's even say an entry level athletic trainer. I would I would say no. 
I'd say there, there is not an argument that it's beyond the scope of practice. I think it's well within our scope of practice uh, to do a, a, a rectal temperature um, in this case. As that's what the literature is saying is the most valid measure. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, one comment that came in uh, was with respect to equipment. You had talked about the ability, uh, whether it should be removed or whether it shouldn't be, and you actually had a slide there, if I remember correctly, of someone immersed with complete football equipment on. One comment was if there's any discussion in the literature as to the difference between lacrosse and hockey equipment, if, there, if, if football is uh, worse, I guess, at, at creating these situations, these negative situations, than hockey and lacrosse, if there's any discussion about the differences between those types of equipment. I have not come across anything in the literature. I don't think there's probably been uh, a lot of research with regards to lacrosse or, or hockey equipment just based on the incidents of the majority of these cases are taking place uh, with football equipment on. Um, but I, I have not come across anything in the literature regarding any other type of equipment. Okay. Uh, and then I think the, the final one we have uh, we, we had actually quite a few come in, but I think the one that uh, we have time for um, here as we wrap things up is um, I've seen posters in locker rooms that show level of dehydration based on urine color, uh, similar to what you showed there uh, on the screen. Uh, do, you have, do you know where you can get those posters? Uh I think you can get them. I know Gatorade has one online. I think if you just type in urine color chart online, you'll get a, you can pick up some. I know the NCAA, um, if you're an NCAA school, they sent one out uh, a couple years ago, and you can request them uh, from the NCAA, or you can, I know you can get the NCAA one online also, uh, and, and, and the PDF, and then it's printed off on a color printer. Oh, there you go. Um, okay. The ones that the one that I, I showed was something that I made just on Microsoft Word and I basically had the the urine color chart I think Gatorade produced and just had it right next to my color screen and kind of matched the colors on the palette just there um, just knowing that the, the most important thing isn't that the colors match 100 percent but just getting people to understand that dark urine is bad right um, you want clearer urine okay well, once again, uh, I appreciate your time. You, you obviously uh, put a lot of time and effort into this discussion. I, I appreciate that very much. I, I took away quite a bit myself on this, uh, some food for thought on this as well. So uh, I'm sure most of our participants did as well. So um, with that, I will, I will type up some of these questions that came in and, and pose those to you by email, and we can get uh, put out a, a put out the, the answers that we come up with to those questions to those people that pose them and just send out an email to all the participants so they can get the answers to those questions as well. Uh, but having said that, we'll, we'll let you off the hook. We'll let you go for this afternoon. And uh, I appreciate your time and energy that you put into this and the effort that you put into this very much. And we'll look forward to having you back another time. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl.